Here's a shave biopsy of a patient with itchy bumps on their trunk. And I really like this entity. I think it's a it's really kind of a, a nice, easy thing to diagnose microscopically and has very distinct features and it's uh, kind of cool looking. So I will show it here. It's a, a good example of what we call <clears throat> Grover's disease or transient acantholytic dermatosis, which is why we call it Grover's disease because that other name is too long for most people to use or remember. And Grover's disease is a nice example of two different microscopic patterns. And it's good because you, you can learn these patterns and there are some other diseases that have this same pattern. One thing that we see here is the normal epidermis, get in focus, apologize for the lighting issue. The normal epidermis, uh, the reedy ridges are kind of elongated, but what you see starting to happen here is that the keratinocytes are falling apart. They're losing contact with their neighbors and leaving white space in between them. And they're starting to kind of round up and get this dense pink cytoplasm, that dense pink color, so that's called, um, that's called <clears throat> acantholysis. Acantholysis means that the spiny layer of the skin, the desmosomes are losing contact with one another and the cells are kind of rounding up and balling up and uh, that's, that's what acantholysis is. And you can see here that the basal layer is still stuck down here onto the uh, dermis but all of the cells above have kind of detached and broken loose. It's almost uh, similar to the pattern that you see in pemphigus vulgaris. And in fact, pemphigus vulgaris is another disease that does have acantholysis. So here we have acantholysis. And then we also have another, another thing that's happening up here is that those, those acantholytic cells, they're breaking free and they're turning into, they're dying and turning into these dense, bright pink little bodies that have dense, purple, dark nuclei. And this pattern of, um, this pattern is called dyskeratosis. It's kind of a funny pattern of the cells go undergoing a cell death and the nuclei get real crunched up in purple and the cytoplasm gets really, really bright pink. And so uh, the acantholytic uh, cells, they, they're, they get called two fancy names. If they're long and thin and look kind of like parakeratosis, people call them grains, like they look like a grain of wheat or something. And if they're more round like this, people call, call them coron, which is the French word for round bodies. And uh, so corons and grains are these little cells up here, and that's dyskeratosis. So acantholysis plus dyskeratosis, and a patient that has little itchy bumps or papules on their trunk is great for Grover's disease. And the other, uh, there are a handful of other diseases that have both acantholysis and dyskeratosis. The other one's called Derriere's disease, which is a genetic syndrome and has a different uh, distribution, large plaques often on the trunk. And uh, another disease is called Haley-Haley disease. Haley-Haley disease has a lot of acantholysis, but doesn't have as much uh, dyskeratosis usually. And it usually involves kind of the fold areas like the groin, um, around the neck or underneath the axilla. It's also a genetic disease, but has lots of acantholysis. And then pemphigus can have acantholysis as well, but it's uh, due to an autoimmune uh, reaction, autoantibodies that are attacking the desmosome spines in the spinous layer of the epidermis. So that little uh, combination, this little small lesion of acantholysis and dyskeratosis, beautiful example of Grover's disease. Grover's disease often gets inflamed and often has uh, some scattered eosinophils in the dermis under it. And that is part of the reason probably that they're, they're kind of itchy. So if I see a little focus of inflammation in the dermis with some eosinophils, um, I'll often look carefully in the epidermis or maybe cut deeper levels to see if there's a little papule of Grover's disease there that I haven't seen. Because sometimes they can clinically mimic a cancer. So you might think, well, this doesn't look anything like that case I just showed you. And in fact, it is kind of a different, more subtle pattern of Grover's disease, but I see this often and I think it's good to recognize because sometimes you'll kind of just catch these changes a little bit on one section and if you cut deeper, you'll find it. So anytime they're looking uh, clinically for folliculitis or something with a kind of itchy, papular, bumpy little rash, I always keep Grover's disease in mind because it can be tricky to find. But here, the clues the most important clue is look at the granular layer. The granular layer is very thick and very hyper um, hyperchromatic, it's very purple. So look over here at the normal skin. The granular layer is a very thin little purple line with these purple keratohyaline granules. It's a very thin layer of purple granules in one or two cells kind of uh, thick at the top of the spinous layer. It divides the spinous layer from the corneal layer.
But when you get over here, that layer gets very thick and you have lots of enlarged cells with big, thick purple granules. You can see those increased uh, granular layer in a lot of different processes, but when I see it as a little focal area, particularly when I start to see some stuff that looks like parakeratosis or maybe dyskeratosis, and I start to see some cells that are starting to fall apart and get acanthalytic, to me that's a good sign that you're dealing with growers. And if you cut deeper, a lot of times you'll see it. I think though, honestly, in the right setting, even changes like this are compatible with Grover's disease in my, um, in my um, um, opinion. And down here in the dermis, again, look at this little infiltrate of lymphocytes underneath the lesion. And again, often if you go closer, you'll find occasional um, eosinophils. You don't have to have them, but you'll often find them. Maybe this one doesn't have any. And look, we cut a little deeper and what happens? You're starting to see the cells falling apart and rounding up and becoming acantholytic. And then they're starting to turn to die and turn into dyskeratotic cells. The, the core rond right here, and then some little grains up there. So another more subtle example of Grover's disease. What you can see from, from low power here is that there's a little bit of increased keratin on top and the cells are starting to fall apart. So we've talked before, that's acantholysis. And you can tell that the granular layer, the purple part, is definitely thickened. So even from low power, you can see there's acantholysis, there's hypergranulosis, there's hyperkeratosis in this one little zone of skin right here. So we look closer and we can confirm that. So again, the, the cells are starting to fall apart and become acantholytic. And we're beginning to see this really thick, blobby kind of hypergranulosis. And so this kind of really thick purple hypergranulosis in this setting is actually almost like a pattern of dyskeratosis. So this basically is acantholysis plus this kind of unusual form of dyskeratosis, or that's the way I think of it at least. So this is really just kind of a, a different presentation of Grover's disease. And it doesn't, um, you know, it looks a little different than uh, some of the other more typical examples of Grover's disease that I've shown before. <laughs> and that um, a lot of people are familiar with from, from books. But I find that this, when I start seeing a little bit of acantholysis and this really thick, very uh, dark purple granules and some increased keratin, if I ever find that like on a punch biopsy, I think, oh, this is probably Grover's and if I'm not sure, I can cut deeper.